slaves globally and practically shutting down the world, we are grateful to be back in person this year. AED this year will focus on Asia and the emerging world order. To launch the Asia Economic Dialogue 2023, may I please call upon the conference convener, Ambassador Gautam Bambawale, to the stage. Welcome, sir. Ambassador Bambawale is a trustee of the Pune International Center and over his long and illustrious career in the Foreign Service has served as India's High Commissioner to Pakistan and as the Ambassador of India to China and Bhutan. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Shilpa. I hope you can hear me loud and clear at the back. Dr. S. Jai Shankar, Honorable External Affairs Minister of India, Linpo Namgate Sering, Honorable Finance Minister of Bhutan, Mr. Ibrahim Amir, Honorable Finance Minister of the Maldives, respected Mr. N. R. Narayan Murthy, Dr. R. A. Mashelkar, President of the Pune International Center, Dr. Vijay Kelkar, Vice President of the Pune International Center, distinguished speakers and honored guests. As convener of this International Geoeconomics Conference, the Asia Economic Dialogue, I extend a very warm welcome to you all. This conference, as all of you would have seen, is jointly organized by the Ministry of External Affairs of India and the Pune International Center. I recall that in its first three years, this, this conference was organized in Mumbai. But in, 19, in 2020, the Pune International Center accepted the responsibility of doing this conference here in the city of Pune. In February 2020, we held our very first conference in physical format at this very location in our city. Soon thereafter, the COVID or corona crisis, a public health crisis, descended on all of us across the globe. Therefore, in 2021 and in 2022, we hosted this conference online in virtual format. Now, after a gap of three years, we are again hosting the Asia Economic Dialogue in physical format. To be fair, we should call it partly physical and partly virtual because some speakers are attending virtually and a large part of the audience is also virtual. Let me also clarify that because we call this conference the Asia Economic Dialogue, it does not imply that we are only about Asia. Not at all. Our conference themes are of global import and significance. We have speakers from around the world, not just from Asia, but also from the United States, Brazil, Mexico, and other places. We are particularly delighted that our partner organization, SEBRI, or the Brazilian Center for International Relations, is also represented at this year's conference. Ladies and gentlemen, as all of you know, 2023 is a special year for India as we chair or preside over the G20. Hence, this year's Asia Economic Dialogue is our own small contribution on this very special occasion. We shall continue to work hard with our partners to grow this conference in the coming years. Let me end by extending once again a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you very much. I hand over back to the Master of Ceremonies. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for your warm welcome and introduction. I now request the President of the Pune International Center, 
Dr. Raghunath Mashelkar to offer his introductory remarks at AD 2023. Dr. Mashelkar, globally renowned scientist, is the recipient of the Padma Vibhushan, India's second highest civilian award. He has served as director of the National Chemical Laboratory, NCL in Pune, as well as the director general of CSIR in Delhi, besides holding numerous other high-ranking positions in India and overseas. Dr. Mashelkar, over to you, sir. Our uh, honorable external affairs minister of India, Dr. S. Jaishankar, excellencies, uh, Mr. Lunpo Namge Shering, the Honorable Finance Minister of Bhutan, Mr. Ibrahim Amir, Honorable Finance Minister of Maldives, our most beloved and respected friend, uh, Mr. Narayan Murthy, our beloved uh, President, Dr. Vijay Kerkar, our most uh, dynamic convener of this conference, Ambassador Gautam Bambawale, Distinguished speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of uh, Pune International Center, I extend a very hearty, a very warm welcome to you all. And how happy we are to see that we are getting back to the old normal of a physical meeting after the new normal had forced us to be satisfied with the virtual meeting. Of course, as a scientist, I must be precise, this is a physical meeting, not just physical, not just digital, as uh, Ambassador Gautam Bambawale explained to you. There are hundreds uh, uh, of uh, participants who will join us, and also several speakers who will join us uh, digitally. We wish to first thank Ministry of External Affairs, on whose behalf we are holding this conference. I especially want to thank our Honorable Minister of External Affairs. We have shown such great trust, such great affection for uh, Pune International Center. Sir, your virtual presence last year during the inaugural was very important, very significant for us. But even more significant is your physical presence uh, in this conference despite the overwhelming responsibilities on behalf of the nation, especially during these turbulent times that you carry day in and day out, and so admirably. Thank you so much. I extend a warm welcome to all the participants to this digital, as I said, AED 2023, on behalf of our beloved city of Pune. Pune is a great city of culture, education, research, innovation, and now it is also known as a vaccine city after the COVID pandemic. Pune has been historically also a city of great thought leaders. And the present Pune is no exception. We pride ourselves in the fact that Pune International Center, during its decade-long journey now, has become a leading center of policy research, thoughts, and ideas. We always emphasize that Pune International Center is an international center in Pune or hosting the International Geoeconomics Conference in the form of its flagship annual conference is just one of the many manifestations of PIC's global outreach program. Let me briefly comment on the choice of our themes of AED so far. The theme of AED 2020 was Asia and emerging international trading systems. Then we had the massive impact of the pandemic. The themes for AD 2021 and AD 2022 chose themselves in the post-pandemic era. And they were most appropriately, first, post-COVID-19 global trade and finance dynamics in 2021, and resilient growth in the post-pandemic world in AD 2022. They followed naturally after the pandemic. But we now go beyond COVID, beyond that one C, and look at these three Cs, namely COVID, conflict, and climate. 
These three C's have provided shocks to the world order recently. The world is still adjusting to these shocks. Asia, including China and India, have been rising. However, international organizations have not yet been reformed to reflect these new realities. They need to be reformed soon in the light of the emerging new world order. The theme for AD 2023 is therefore Asia and the emerging world order. You will see that the topics chosen are intimately woven around this central theme. I must proudly make a special mention of India. India holds the presidency of the G20 this year and therefore two important sessions deal with not only India's vision for the G20 presidency but also with how the global south will shape the G20 agenda. We at PIC are proud of the fact that 44 speakers from 12 nations will be participating in the deliberations. Finally, looking at the extent of participation, quality of participants, and that of the deliberations, and finally, the impact of the AD event so far, some of our well-wishers have been saying that AD is clearly emerging at the divorce of Asia. On behalf of PIC, I want to assure our Ministry of External Affairs and also the nation that we at PIC will do everything to live up to not only that expectation, but even go beyond to create a DEVOS Plus in years to come. I'm sure AD 2023 will be an intellectually stimulating and exhilarating experience with deliberations which will set the mood, the tone, the direction for our accelerated, sustainable, and equitable global growth. Again, a very, very, very warm welcome to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much, sir for that rich background, for the positivity, for the encouragement, and for setting the tone for AED 2023. Our inaugural session will be moderated by Ambassador Gautam Bambawale. I welcome to the stage our distinguished chair and panelists, His Excellency Mr. Ibrahim Amir, the Honorable Minister of Finance from the Maldives, His Excellency Mr. Leonpo Namgai Shering, the Honorable Finance Minister of the Royal Government of Bhutan, and His Excellency Dr. S. Jay Shankar, the Honorable Minister for External Affairs, Government of India. Welcome. Welcome once again. Ambassador Bambawale, the floor is yours. Thank you. So what we thought was that instead of having speeches as normally happens at other conferences, this inaugural session will be more in the form of a discussion with all three ministers from India, from uh, Bhutan, as well as from uh, the Maldives. And perhaps if I may start, with Dr. S. Jay Shankar, Honorable External Affairs Minister of India. Um, you know, the title of this particular conference is Asia in the Emerging World Order. So one of the underlying assumptions is that there is some change taking place in the world order. As Dr. Mashelkar said in his opening remarks, the three C's, and sir, you have mentioned this in your remarks earlier too in your speeches, that the three C's of COVID conflict and climate have impacted the world and have shocked the world, provided shocks to the world. But sir, what I'd like to ask you is that in this background, and as you sit in Delhi, what are the three most important things, themes, uh, which 
go through your mind? What are the three most important things which animate your mind in your day-to-day -day work? Dr. Jai Shankar, right please. Now. Right now. Yes. Well, um, if I were to pick uh, three big issues in the uh, forefront of my thoughts, uh, one, I would actually uh, reflect on our neighborhood. Neighborhood, partly because we are the neighborhood, the three of us. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, an approach since uh, 2014 called Neighborhood First. Uh, we, you know, it's the neighborhood itself has seen a sea change. I'm not sure it's something which uh, uh, people in our own country fully understand and appreciate. I think the neighborhood perhaps does more uh, than we ourselves do. So to me, the neighborhood, neighborhood first would be one big, uh, I would say, concern, focus, thought, call it what you will. The second would be the state of the world, you know. Uh, would be the state of the world. I think uh, the three series is a very snappy uh, summing up of the problems, which is uh, COVID, uh, conflict, uh, and climate. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and climate is increasingly an operational problem, not just an existential one, because, uh, you, you know, we can see already that climate is creating disruptions uh, to the uh, routine economic, uh, you know, routine operations of the global economy. Uh, but the, it's not obviously enough to say I've got a 3C problem. You've got to have a solution. And I think the solution is also a kind of a 3C solution, uh, which is that somewhere there has to be uh, uh, a degree of creativity, uh, uh, a sense of caution about this world we are entering to. And finally, I think that the world is suffering today from credibility issues. So to me, there are three C's as a problem. There are probably three C's as some kind of solution. And the third is the G20 presidency. The, it's, a, it's a very uh, important responsibility at a very critical moment. Uh, and uh, I think there are a lot of expectations from India. Uh, and uh, we too must look at the world and see how we can use it to enhance global awareness, which is very important for India, if it is to uh, uh, if it is to uh, develop the mindset uh, of a rising power. Uh, so, those would be my slightly long-winded answers, which is really neighborhood first, uh, state of the world, and G20. Thank you. May, perhaps I could ask the same question to Honorable Linpo, uh, the Finance Minister of Bhutan. Sir, as you sit in Thimpu, and when you go to your office every day, what are the three major things or three major topics or three major issues which, uh, you know, animate your thinking, which uh, uh, have your attention uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? Linpo, if I could uh, request you to uh, take that question, please. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Bambawali. Uh, first of all, uh, my uh, greetings and very good evening to all the distinguished participants here. And my apologies for exposing, exposing my leg because this is where uh, the very concept of GNH is ingrained. So I think uh, probably uh, some of the distinguished delegates might not have seen the costume that we are used to wearing in Bhutan as a part of our national dress. Uh, anyways, uh, coming back to the topic, uh, I think uh, for Bhutan as a, uh, a small uh, developing nation challenged with the topographical difficulties, and I mean to say we are landlocked, and especially because of the COVID, in the post-pandemic world, the most three, the three important aspects that actually lingers around my mind, that actually disturbs me and sometimes I see that as an opportunity to grow from strength to strength, but sometimes I see that as a troublemaker for the small developing nation like Bhutan. And the first and the foremost is, uh, is the geopolitical tensions around the world, and case in point, the ongoing Ukraine war, which has actually impacted 
and uh, severely disrupted the supply chain. And uh, this has actually resulted in Bhutan as a small economy and uh, most importantly, we being largely an in, uh, import-driven economy, we are, succumb we are uh, susceptible to you know, like, uh, the, the injected form of an inflation and which has caused an macroeconomic imbalances. And this is a serious concern that uh, we don't see an upfront uh, intervention or response to that. But I think uh, having a, a dear neighbor with a lot of economic resilience and a lot of innovations like India, I think we are very much uh, positive that uh, the growth in India will uh, directly or indirectly translate or cascade, have a cascading effect into a smaller economy like us. Second aspect that I see is uh, the climate change. I think climate change uh, uh, is, has become a, a kind of a universal uh, uh, the phenomenon, the, 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 the challenge whether the country is sea locked or landlocked. And for instance, in Bhutan, we always say that, we always uh, uh, praise ourselves saying that we are not only carbon neutral, but we are carbon negative. That's the fact. We have a forest coverage of 72%. And our constitution mandates that forest coverage should be maintained all, at all times at 60%. But having said that, I think if our, the partners across the world doesn't play their equal roles and responsibilities, it doesn't keep up the woods. I think uh, smaller nations cannot make much difference. The biggest challenge uh, for Bhutan, because of the climate change effect, is the glacial lake outburst. We are highly susceptible and vulnerable to glove. And third important aspect uh, that actually you know uh, bothers me day on day basis is uh, is the widening trade deficit. That's also a macroeconomic imbalance. So basically, we are, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, India being our largest trading partner, with the presence of Honorable uh, Minister, uh, Honorable S.J. Shankar here, India has been doing a wonderful, uh, you know, facilitating in every sphere for Bhutan. But further, uh, I think uh, there are scopes where, uh, you know, a country like Bhutan needs to actually uh, uh, discuss and dive deeper into understanding a lot of problems uh, along the borders uh, with, uh, with regard to non-tariff barriers. So that uh, 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 I thought that I, uh, I will be raising at a different level with, with uh, the Honorable Ministers uh, from Government of India and of course uh, with the Honorable S. Shankar here. So these are three important aspects that I see that uh, for a small landlocked country like Bhutan, if we don't uh, uh, find a solution, a prominent solution, which of course should be sustainable, I think uh, post-pandemic recovery will be an uphill task for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, last but not the least, let me turn to the Honorable Finance Minister of the Maldives, His Excellency Mr. Ibrahim Amir, and ask him the same question. Uh, Mr. Minister, what are the three things which are at the top of your mind uh, when you go to work every day in Mali? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to really thank the Pune International Center and also the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs uh, from India to, uh, for giving me this opportunity. It gives me great uh, pride in sharing the stage with Honorable uh, Foreign Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar and as well Minister of Finance from uh, Bhutan, a dear friend of mine. Uh, as the Minister of Finance, uh, the, the way I think about these uh, uh, three things at the current at, uh, point of time uh, may be vastly different from uh, others. Everyone here will know Maldives uh, as uh, a destination for sun, sand uh, and the sea. Uh, but I believe uh, we have a lot to offer. Uh, Maldives is not a poor country. Uh, Maldives now is a upper middle income country. And as the Minister of Finance uh, Ambassador, the, the three things that really bothers me uh, right now is actually, as mentioned, uh, number one, uh, climate change. Uh, as you know, uh, 
Maldives is uh, very much uh, prone to the effects of uh, climate change. Our very uh, existence is threatened by the changes in climate change. And uh, a large part of our uh, budget is spent on climate adaptation uh, and climate mitigation efforts. And uh, if you look at the numbers, um, from 2011 till now, we have, we have spent around uh, $587 million on uh, climate mitigation and climate uh, adaptation projects. Uh, and also, if you look at our main uh, sectors uh, that drive our economy, it is mainly based on our natural resources, which is the tourism uh, we've, and also the fishery sector. Uh, so uh, the climate adaptation and climate mitigation efforts. Um, Maldives is very low line. Uh, and the, why it bothers me is that uh, uh, so far we have not been able to tap into the uh, climate finances, cheap climate finances that is being uh, pledged by the uh, developed uh, countries in several COP uh, meetings. So because of that, we are forced to go to uh, the markets, uh, borrow at a higher cost, and then make sure our islands are there for the tourists to come, and we, we, we are there. The, the other thing is, uh, second thing is the external shocks. Uh, Namely, very recently we have the COVID, and now we have the uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, during COVID, as you know, uh, Maldives is very much uh, reliant on tourism, and we closed our borders uh, for three months, and our uh, economy declined by around uh, 33%. Uh, Maldives was one of the worst hit countries uh, during COVID, but it really showed the resilience of our tourism sector that we were also uh, one of the countries that rebounded very strongly in 2021 and even 2022. Uh, and now, uh, now we are actually we have surpassed uh, where we were in 2019, and our tourism sector is uh, faring better than we were in 2019. And also, as the Minister of Finance, uh, I am also um, always thinking about the developmental challenges. Uh, all the more important because uh, during COVID, our GDP declined, our government revenue declined, and our debt situation also got worsened. And uh, we cannot delay development. Uh, we cannot have 10, uh, 15 years for uh, water and sanitation projects, uh, climate uh, uh, adaptation projects. So how do we make sure that uh, we have developmental projects and then also uh, be mindful of our fiscal sustainability and also our debt sustainability issues? Uh, so in short, uh, number one, climate change. Uh, number two, the external shocks uh, the uh, the COVID and also the Ukraine war. I, I would also like to highlight because of the Ukraine-Russia war, uh, the uh, small island nations uh, like the Maldives and uh, I, I believe the uh, Bhutan also, in most of the countries in, because of the increase in oil prices, in, increase in food prices, it really affected our fiscal uh, space. So that is also some uh, a very worrying um, uh, aspect of this war. And the, thirdly, uh, the developmental uh, efforts. How do we make sure that uh, there, is a, there is continuation of our developmental projects? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minister Jayashankar, if I could uh, ask you and uh, ask you to elaborate on India's approach to its presidency of the G20. Uh, what are the major themes that we want to take up? Um, I saw from some of the recent developments that we want to voice the opinions of the Global South. Uh, if you could talk a little bit to that issue. Also, uh, in different cities of India, we have felt the impact of the G20 
It is one of the objectives of this government to take the G20 to different parts of India. And we've had one meeting at least, if not more, here in Pune. And we saw how it did positively impact Pune at that time. Uh, so could I request you to talk a little more about uh, India's ideas behind its presidency of the G20? Uh, Gautam, let me do one thing. Let me take it in three parts. Uh, how are we, uh, how are we uh, going about the G20 presidency? Uh, number two, uh, what you said about the uh, voice of the Global South. And three, what are our expectations of uh, what's going to come out of the G20? I would say uh, on the first one, uh, you know, the G20 today, it, it began out in 2008 as a, as a very immediate response to the global financial crisis. I think many of you are very intimately familiar with it. Uh, and over a period of time with each G20 presidency, more and more layers and facets were added to it. So, uh, you know, environment got in, health got in, uh, uh, foreign policy uh, got in, business got in, youth. So it, it, uh, today there are actually 15 tracks, 15 ministerial tracks. The heart of the G20 is still very much finance. It's still very much finance. It's still very much development. The mandate of the G20 is uh, really growth and development. Now, how are we going to go about it? Uh, because it has developed so many fan, uh, aspects, facets, uh, there are roughly about 200 meetings which any president, uh, uh, any country which is holding the presidency, has to organize in the space of that year. So when we started thinking about it, uh, Prime Minister had you know, this thought that it should not be a capital-centric exercise nor should it be, you know, a mice industry exercise. So you don't want people to get off the plane, go to the meeting, do the hotel dinner, get on a plane and go back. And you don't want them to do Delhi and, you know, maybe Agra, Jaipur and say, okay, I've seen India, uh, this is three, I've had three pictures and I'm done. The idea was, this is an opportunity for the world to get to know India better. So get people to travel to ev you know, every province of India, to different cities of India, cities which are not, and towns which are not normally used to hosting international uh, conventions and meetings. Obviously, there's a kind of a threshold. They should have the infrastructure to, uh, to deal with it. And the advantage of doing this is, uh, considering there are, uh, there are 200 meetings and, you know, each one of them will have, at the very least, a few hundred uh, delegates and officials who will come. Uh, just look at the total number of people who will actually be visiting us from foreign countries in that year. And these are, in today's parlance, in their respective societies, they're all influencers of, of uh, every kind. You know. So you have actually, by spreading it across the country, this is a kind of a marketing of India to the influential people of those 20 countries and changing their thinking, exposing India uh, to them, exposing India in every sense, you know, the cultural diversity, the, uh, the, the socio-economic changes which are taking place, uh, the energy and the sort of enthusiasm today uh, among people, the cuisine, the arts, the music. So that's one side of it. The other side is also every time uh, a town or a city or a university or a, you know, institution, they host such a meeting. Now, I've come from uh, uh, earlier in the day to symbiosis, and they are hosting the U20 meeting. Now, for them, it's a big deal. You know, they are, you know everybody is excited about it. Everybody is getting prepared about it. Uh, some months ago, I went to Imphal. Now, all we did, uh, you know, as part of what was their major festival, we actually uh, opened what was a G20 photo, uh, photo, photo booth kind of. There was a logo with, you know, leaves on all sides. You stand out there and, but 
the amount of interest in Imphal, because that sense, oh, something is coming our way, we're going to be part of it. Yeah. This too is part of uh, developing an awareness in the country about the world. And we should do that. We need to do that. We are actually behind the curve. We are today the fifth largest economy in the world. We will be the third largest economy very soon. But if you look at our significance to the global workplace, and I have somebody like Dr. Naran Murthy sitting in front of me, our significance to the global workplace is actually going to grow enormously because there's a fundamental mismatch of the demand and supply when it comes to talent and skills today. And countries in a knowledge economy are willing to take bold steps to fix it. So, as we say, you know, this is getting uh, the world India ready, is getting India world ready. And that's the way this whole thing uh, is being planned. Now, voice of the global south. Why do we need voice of the global south? Because what we saw in the last year, and it's something which we had seen not with the same degree of disquiet, uh, but especially last year it was very evident to us, which is one big problem was taking up all the oxygen. And the, the second order, third order consequences of that, those were not being adequately uh, sort of appreciated. I mean, if you heard, I mean, our two finance ministers sitting here, what is their concern? They are talking today of the external shocks which is creating fiscal stress on them because their oil prices are going up, their food prices are going up, they are worrying whether the fertilizer prices, in fact, will the fertilizer uh, be afford accessible apart from being affordable. So we felt that uh, it was important uh, that the entirety of global problems be put at the center of G20 not just one particular issue, and however important that issue might be. And secondly, that if there is one country among the G20, which the, you know, the global south, the global south trusts us, whatever you might say. I mean, there is that sense, and that sense, by the way, has been heightened by vaccine Maitri. You know, that if you go to Africa today, to the Caribbean, to parts of Asia, and say, People say, yeah, you know, there's India at least, okay, that guy will voice our worries. So, uh, but we didn't want to do it with a sense of presumption that, that, you know, we speak for everybody. We wanted a consultative process. So, in fact, very painstakingly last month, uh, we did consultations. Uh, this was the Prime Minister himself, uh, myself, uh, uh, Finance Minister, Trade Minister, Environment Minister. We spoke to 125 countries at our level. And today, and, and the basic conversation was G20 is going to happen, so tell us what is your concern. You know, what is it? And then you kind of make a distillate of, of uh, that and, and articulate it. And I think it's important today, uh, not just in the G20, I think part of the problems even with the UN and the UN Security Council is that the voice of Global South is missing. If there is a logical, uh, shall I say, candidate for uh, that responsibility, it is us. Uh, we would be shirking our duty if we didn't do that. Now, what will happen out of the G20? Look, it's a bit early uh, because we have to, to uh, I think tomorrow the, uh, the finance minister's uh, meeting, physical meeting is taking place. The foreign minister's meeting is on the first, uh, first and second of March. Uh, we will have to go through a set of meetings to see uh, what happens at G20 is uh, a lot of things are on slow boil, okay? Now, which one of them gets cooked in one particular year is difficult to predict, you know. It has to be decided amongst the G20. Uh, but uh, uh, there are a set of issues and I would like to reassure both our colleagues that green finance is really right absolutely on top of the issues. I mean, today if you ask me three big uh, issues in the world, I would put really green finance. Uh, uh, because I'm not putting green growth because I think without finance, people talk about growth, but they seem to think that ambitions should be divorced from resources. The reality is we haven't moved that far ahead because the resources were not there. So I would, I, I think this will take a little while to emerge probably really till the summit in September.
Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, the Maldives and Bhutan are both um, part of the Global South. So let me start by asking the Honorable Finance Minister of the Maldives. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Minister, what are your expectations at this point of time as the world is exiting the COVID pandemic, as we look for greater growth, as your fiscal space shrinks, as you rightly said, what are your expectations from the G20? And uh, so let me request the Honorable Finance Minister of the Maldives to go first, and then request uh, Honorable Finance Minister of Bhutan to answer the same question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I believe uh, for countries like Maldives, uh, it is very important uh, in order to address the issues of climate change that uh, we have uh, cheaper uh, financing available. Uh, at the moment, we also have to make sure that we carry out uh, developmental projects. Uh, during COVID, you, you saw that because of the decline in GDP, our debt, debt, debt to GDP numbers went up to around 150%. Uh, now, again, because increase in uh, tourist arrivals, uh, tourism sector is faring uh, better than expected. Our GDP is also uh, now uh, increasing. So we, we see that the debt numbers are also uh, coming down. In order to make sure that uh, we have uh, fiscal space uh, and also carry out developmental projects, we need uh, uh, climate financing, uh, which is cheaper, uh, but the so far uh, during different different uh, COP meetings, uh, uh, around hundred billion dollars have been pledged, uh, but we have not been able to tap into this climate financing and use this financing to make sure that uh, we are able to use this funding for very important. Uh, climate adaptation projects and mitigation projects uh, for countries like the Maldives. And in the Maldives, it is uh, always an emergency. Uh, we cannot wait uh, one, two years uh, for the project to documentation to be complete. Uh, and after two, three years, we get the funding. And when we get the funding, the island is not there anymore. 20, 30 percent of our islands are eroded by if you don't do anything uh, for, let's say, two, three years. So it is an, always an emergency uh, situation, and we are forced to use our budgets, our own domestic resources to make sure that we have uh, climate adaptation measures like building coastal protection, like building the harbors as well. Uh, so I believe. Uh, at the top of the G20 uh, agenda, uh, the climate, the issue of climate financing, green financing is uh, very important. And now uh, I have had various discussions with uh, other multilateral organizations uh, uh, like IMF, World Bank, and others as well. Uh, green financing, uh, climate financing, or any other financing, it, it, there is no differentiation. Uh, even with, if, with climate financing, there are a lot of conditions. Um, and I believe the, there shouldn't be any conditions with uh, climate financing. It, the only thing should be that it should be earmarked for climate adaptation projects and climate mitigation projects. If you look at, let's say, for example, uh, the, uh, what is the rating of the country and what are the macroeconomic fund fundamentals, and then uh, make available this climate financing, I believe it defeats the problem. Uh, because um, we, we are planning to go to the market and issue green and blue bonds, uh, but uh, uh, green, blue, or any other color you give, these financing does not differentiate uh, with any conventional financing because at the end of the day, we get the same rate, uh, same rates as uh, any conventional financing. So I believe 
uh, there should be some kind of an architecture where, or oh, mechanism where uh, mostly uh, climate vulnerable nations and most Im more importantly, uh, small island developing states who are at the forefront of climate change should be, should be able to get uh, cheaper uh, climate financing because, and it should be yesterday and not today or tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and if I could turn to you, Linpo, and uh, ask you the same question, how does Bhutan, what are Bhutan's expectations from the G20? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Gautam. Uh, first of all, uh, let me take this opportunity to uh, congratulate uh, India under the leadership of uh, Sri Narendra Modi ji uh, for assuming uh, for taking the presidentship of the G20, and of course uh, for Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister for assuming the chair of the G20. Uh, I think uh, before I jump onto the expectation, uh, I would like to, uh, with, Lord, with conviction, I would like to uh, glaringly make a mention here that uh, uh, I personally, Bhutan personally doesn't have an inch of doubt with the capability of India to chair this uh, world premier forum, uh, bringing more world leaders and the thinkers uh, uh, to deliberate on the, the world orders. Uh, and my special congratulations also goes to you, sir, for, for, for your leadership in that. Uh, when it comes to G20, I think uh, the only expectation as a small developing nation would be uh, because uh, I see that whatever agenda is uh, tabled for G20, probably unlike the past G20, especially after the pandemic, the whole perception and the perspective to how you look at the problem has changed. Because pandemic has brought in a lot of uh, new perceptions, new innovations, the way we think, the way we conduct our businesses. So for that matter, I think uh, probably the, 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 the core emphasis of the upcoming G20 summit in India in September will basically, I, I, I assume in that manner, the way Honorable Excellent Affairs Minister was making, making a mention that it will be more focused on the post-pandemic recovery, uh, respective of the size of the country. Uh, again, we don't have a doubt of, uh, on India that uh, by representing the Global South, I think it also represents our voice. So for that matter, I think uh, the major concern for us as a small developing nation will be the debt, debt distress in, 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 in medium to long term. So for that matter, I think uh, uh, we, 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 our expectation, and as well you can describe it as our request, will be to, to, to uh, look into relaxing the global financial conditions. Because with the tightening global financial conditions, I think it is incurring a lot of, uh, imposing a lot of uh, challenge on us, uh, which we don't actually on our own don't find a solution to that. And the second would be, uh, I think, uh, because we need to understand that other than the pandemic, where actually the problem has emerged, where the problem has erupted, because we never expected a uh, Ukraine war. So for that matter, I think G20 is a platform as well, beyond economic discussions, uh, dialogues, I think it is also, I perceive that it is also a forum for the, the, the global leaders to discuss on the global peace, prosperity, and stability, uh, from, through which the, 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 you know, uh, everything comes into order. And the third point that I expect would be, as rightly mentioned by the Honorable External Affairs Minister, on the green financing, which is a very, very pertinent uh, uh, topic for a country like Bhutan, uh, because of our, uh, the, the the, the efforts that we made in conserving the nature. So we see this as an opportunity, as a means to uh, meet the fiscal deficit and also uh, to address the fiscal uh, instability issues. Uh, because uh, when you talk about innovative financing, we only think about issuance of grain bond. But this being a new concept, uh, uh, I think, uh, if this could be taken forward, and I think we see a lot of opportunities to leverage on that. And lastly, but not the least, the expectation. I think this goes as a wish list, a long list from my side, but nevertheless, I see that uh, uh, 
when you actually access the global financing, be it from the multilateral development banks or bilateral partners, I think uh, the conditions where we access the financing, I think uh, irrespective of the size of the economy, irrespective of the size of the country, the conditions are, are I would see that often is the same. So basically, uh, in G20 forum, because G20 members also largely represent in the World Bank, ADB, and uh, other MDBs, so uh, we see that uh, if there is an opportunity as to represent the voice of South, Global South, if there is an opportunity for a small nation to, to uh, have a, a better concessional conditions to access the global financing. So these are, you know, like basically it goes like a shopping list, but I think if we really dive deeper into it and understand probably these are the, the critical issues that can really give a, a, a prominent facelift uh, for the smaller economies like us to uh, uh, recover uh, uh, in a sustainable manner in a post-pandemic world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Linpo. Uh, Honorable Minister Jayashankar, you mentioned neighborhood first. And my question to you would be that, you know, previous governments also placed a lot of importance on our neighborhood, on our region, on our South Asian region. Uh, but is there something that your government is doing which is different from earlier? Have we moved into a higher gear where our neighborhood is concerned? Um, and uh, I would request you to talk a little bit about our neighborhood uh, and how we are helping not just countries like the Maldives and, and Bhutan who are present here today, but also other neighbors. Um, you know, uh, Gautam, you and I have been in this business a long time and a long time over multiple, multiple governments. So even though I'm in politics today and you lead a more happier existence, uh, the fact is uh, there are real changes and I don't think these, should ne these are not necessarily political points that anybody is scoring. Uh, no question that after 2014, there has been a, a really a, a profound transformation in the way in which uh, India has approached its neighbors. Uh, and as I said, uh, a lot of it is because uh, actually the, you can say it's the Indian leadership, the Indian system, whatever. We have gone back to the basics and asked ourselves the question, what kind of relationship do we want with our neighbors? So if you ask me what has changed, uh, I would say, uh, look, uh, if you use the metrics of connectivity, of projects, of uh, different kinds of developmental partnership uh, expressions. So one part of it is what, what is it we are doing? Another part is how are we doing it? Uh, and you know, uh, and the third is really the, the uh, sweeping scale of what we are doing. And finally, that sense that today uh, our fortunes are all tied together. I would honestly very, very objectively say by each of these metrics, there's actually been a big change in a decade. And let me illustrate that, okay? I would, let me, for example, point to Maldives. You know. Today, uh, if you have uh, in Maldives a very major connectivity project, like the Greater Malay Connectivity Project, we've never done a project of that scale in our neighborhood. In fact, we've never done a project of that scale anywhere in the world. Uh, if you were to, again, uh, I, I was there uh, a few weeks ago uh, uh, laying the foundation stone of an airport uh, lengthening project we're doing because we do realize that by uh, modernizing that airport, giving it greater capacity, a whole new set of islands now have access to international tourism in a way in which they didn't, and that very directly feeds into the GDP. So that one airport project actually has an enormous multiplier effect uh, on their economy. Now, I'm giving you two big examples, but there are examples 
uh, we had these uh, in, in the south, in Addu. Uh, there are a whole set of, uh, you know, practical development projects of a community kind, you know, which, which actually people appreciate. You know, when they think of international cooperation, it's a nice word. But if that means that they've just got a water purification plant or an uh, electricity uh, connection or better roads or a sewage system, it means the world to them. Now, that's what's happening there. Now, to differing degrees, in every one of our uh, neighboring uh, countries, I mean, uh, again, uh, if I, I'm just using since you asked this question, a decade as a differential. We are today uh, supplying electricity uh, to our neighbors, except Bhutan from whom we are buying electricity. And now, by the way, we have started to buy electricity from Nepal as well. Now, to my mind, giving them, you know, selling them electricity is very important because they need it. Buying electricity from them is equally important because it's a, it's a regular revenue source for them. So, uh, and now that's only possible if we, along with them, build the uh, grid connectivity. A second example, many of our neighbors were actually paying much higher prices for their energy. Nepal was a very prime example because energy, petrol and diesel used to be trucked in. Now, when we built this uh, pipeline from Motihari to Amlekarj, it's brought down uh, prices of fuel very, very significantly in Nepal. You know, we built roads in the, in the what are called the Terai roads, the Hulaki roads out there. I mean, they were there. We've, we've sort of modernized them, broadened them. The moment you get much broader roads, I mean, there's a clear, uh, both a supply chain and a, a economic uh, benefit that comes. Now, I can give you a Bangladeshi variant of it, you know. Uh, you can see it in roads, you can see it in rails, you can see it in access to ports, in waterways. So the entire neighborhood actually in the last 10 years today has started to realize, frankly, that India is prepared to put its money where its mouth is, that these are not just uh, sermons and homilies on good neighbor relationship that we give out. It is backed by very solid uh, cooperation projects. and I. I think, uh, uh, Minister, you would bear me out. I mean, in the case uh, of Bhutan as well. I mean, even in this, ten, this period of the last uh, decade, we've had actually a new hydro, Mangdechu has uh, come, come on uh, stream hydro project. We are looking at some very big health commitments, uh, at educational commitments. So uh, at one level today, the neighborhood actually believes that India as a non-reciprocal, uh, I would say a collective view, a regional view of the neighborhood, where the prosperity of India, the resources of India, are actually a, a lifting tide for the entire neighborhood. They also know, as you can see from the Sri Lankan experience, that if, God forbid, something really uh, catastrophic happens, that India is there, that India is there in a macroeconomic sense, but India is also there, by the way, in case, you know, you have a, uh, a climate event or a, as they had some oil spills and, and things like that. So go around the, you know, I, look, we've all done this beat for many years. Today, when you do this beat, you hear very, very uh, uh, different uh, feedback uh, about India. Uh, and it's also reflected in, you know, uh, their own uh, sort of uh, their, uh, shall I say, enthusiasm for even in business uh, today in uh, getting, getting closer. So, I, you know, I, again, I do not uh, make this uh, so much as a political point, but I do say that greater uh, a vision of a region. Uh, a very clear direction from the top that look, please do, approach the neighbors generously, non-reciprocally, credibly, do it on the ground, follow it up, ask, look to see what is important for them, try and do things which will impact, you know, the lives of the people. 
All this, I think, has really paid off. Thank you. I must ask you a follow-up question, Minister Jayashankar, and my audience, I know, wants me to ask you this question, that in our whole neighborhood first policy, there's one country to which you sent me as ambassador or high commissioner to our west, uh, called Pakistan, with which we have nothing to do, which we are doing nothing about. So, you know, at this point of time when Pakistan is going through some economic difficulties, do you think uh, this is a point when there can be some kind of rapprochement between uh, India and Pakistan? You know, uh, look, uh, obviously it's in nobody's interest that any country, least of all a neighboring country, get into uh, severe economic difficulties. You know, nobody, nobody sensible, nobody mature would even nurse that thought. But it's an equal fact that when people, any country gets into a serious economic problem, that country has to make policy choices and governance decisions to get themselves out of it. You know, another country, neighbor or non-neighbor or another institution, others cannot solve a problem if you're not prepared to solve it yourself. So let's be clear on the first point, which is that the solution, there's not a Pakistan point, it's a generic global point. Any country in deep economic difficulties has to come out of it through, I mean, what the world can do is to provide options and support systems. But the, the bottom line has to be done by that country and often it will require very tough choices. Now, uh, I want all of us to remember, we went through this 30 years ago. So it's not something which happens to other people. It also happened to us. It happened to us not once. It happened to us maybe not with the same severity at various other points of time uh, in our uh, modern history uh, as well. But having said that, the reality of this particular relationship is that it has a fundamental issue which we cannot and we must not avoid. And that issue is that of terrorism. Because the moment you start doing these walk-arounds, that, you know, let's find a joint statement which will uh, pay, you know, which will get us agreed language. You know, let us reach out at this point and see where this goes. That's been the talk of the last 75 years. And look where it got us. So I think we need clarity that, and we, we mustn't be in denial uh, of, of what are uh, very fundamental rea problems in that re relationship. And just as, you know, a country has to fix its uh, economic issues, a country has to fix its political issues too. A country has to fix its social issues. You know, I mean, you c no country is ever going to come out of a difficult situation and become a prosperous power if its basic industry is terrorism. So, they, you know, the, among the changes which need to be made are also changes pertaining uh, to, to, to all of that. So, I think that remains uh, a very major problem. I also think, you know, as today, as a as someone in politics, if I were to uh, look at any uh, big decision I'm making, I would also look at what is the public sentiment. You know, I would have a pulse. What do my people feel about it? And I think you know the answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me say that we are going to, oh, oh, slowly, I'm going to turn to the two honorable ministers from uh, both Bhutan and the Maldives. But after that round of questions, we're going to open it up to the floor. So please keep your questions ready. Let there be questions, short, to the point. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we are coming there. So let me first turn to Linpo Namget Sering. And you know, Honorable Minister Jayashankar spoke about how India is providing development assistance in its neighborhood. Could you uh, expound on how India and Bhutan are working together on developmental partnership between our two countries? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, more than me, I think uh, Ambassador Gautam, you are in Bhutan, so uh, you must be knowing everything excellent, in a, you know, like exactly. 
And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud to make a mention here that uh, uh, the former diplomatic, uh, through the establishment of the mission office, which was later upgraded into the embassies in Delhi as well as the, uh, the, in, in Thimpu, I think since 1961, when we started our first developmental plan, just like in India, you have a cycle of five-year development plan. We started our five-year development, five developmental plan from 1961. So the two subsequent plans, the first five-year plan and second five-year plan are fully, fully financed by government of India. So I think that, is, that in itself shows the, 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 uh, uh, the, the kind of an instrumental role, kind of a facilitating role the government of India has played in shaping the developmental activities in the country, in Bhutan. Uh, indeed, uh, you know, uh, the, the, you know, when the, our, the third king, His Majesty King Jigmin Doji Wanchu, on the invitation of Honorable Prime Minister uh, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, he visited Bhutan back in 1953, and there's a reciprocal visit, uh, you know, uh, on the invitation of a third king, from uh, India, uh, you know, Jawan, Pandit Jawana Nehru, uh, uh, with the daughter Indra Gandhi ji, they, they came to Bhutan on, the, you know, riding on a yak. Basically, we didn't had a, a motorable road by then. That was in 1958, and that was the very much very time where where the groundbreaking ceremony of uh, the first national highway from Funsuling, the bordering town with the state of West Bengal and Thimpu, was uh, initiated. So that was back in 1958. So I think uh, if you look into the history of our developmental activities, I think uh, the policy that India is adopting right now, the neighborhood first policy, I think uh, uh, India has uh, actually gone beyond that and, uh, and uh, really uh, uh, brought a, a, a lot of developmental activities. So I think uh, India is not only the, 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 the closest neighbor to Bhutan per se, but I think India is also the largest uh, trading partner to Bhutan. And if you look into the, the import pattern, because as I mentioned earlier, Bhutan is largely an import driven. So we, you know, like if you look into, I think we are seeing an increasing trade deficit all, you know, like uh, for, for past many, many years, I would say decades. And 93% of our imports are made from India. And if you look into Bhutan's export, which is substantially low as compared to the import that we're making, I would say 98% of our imports, exports are going to India. So uh, I think uh, then in, in itself you can, you can make out that uh, the, the, the kind of, uh, you know, like uh, the, the, um, the relationship that uh, the two countries uh, share. And one interesting fact I would like to uh, make a mention here that since Bhutanese neutral drum currency is packed with Indian rupee, uh, if you look into the historical, the trend of uh, the, the, the economic performance, the GDP pattern, you see like for past two decades, Bhutan actually follows the pattern of Indian economy. So uh, we are a bit optimistic because uh, now uh, the World Economic Outlook report uh, published in January 2023 indicates that uh, advanced economies, the growth is downgraded emerging markets, emerging economies like India, I think uh, uh, because of the kind of resilience that uh, India, Indian economy has, I think uh, your GDP uh, is not downgraded by significant figure, it's just downgraded as for the forecast of IMF, it's just downgraded from 6.8 to 6.1 percent, which is, which is significant, I would say. I think you are, your Indian economy is only going to grow, so for that matter, I think it doesn't mean that we're being complacent here, but uh, looking at the historical trend of a Bhutanese economic growth, which follows the Indian trajectory, I see that there definitely is going to be a spillover benefit and effect into our Bhutanese economy. So for that matter, I would again say that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think uh, beyond neighborhood first policy, uh, I think uh, uh, our relationship, uh, be it in terms of trade, be it in terms of uh, uh, you know, uh, culture, be in terms of uh, anything you talk about, I think it is, it is only going to grow from strength to strength. And, uh, and of course, I would like to again take this opportunity to thank the people of India, the government of India, for, uh, because the, we are the first recipient of the vaccine, the COVID shield, 
250 doses back in 2020 uh, through that never response policy and indeed uh, India has chartered your own flight to reach the vaccines and hand over to the people of Bhutan. That was, that was a very momentous opportunity and I would like to thank for that. Thank you very much. And if I could turn to you, Honorable Finance Minister of Maldives, Mr. Ibrahim Amir, on the same question about uh, India and the Maldives uh, developmental partnership. How, how is it progressing? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if somebody asked me uh, what they can do to help the Maldives uh, address the, uh, the fiscal issues now and the debt sustainability issues that we face now, I always say, come to the Maldives, go to a resort, and enjoy our hospitality. Because you are spending dollars there that addresses our, <laughs> our fiscal sustainability issues. And, Minister, uh, you should invite the AD to hold its next session there. Yes, <laughs> we should do that. Uh, so uh, now what we see is that actually Indian travelers um, have is actually not the, uh, share the number one market for the uh, tourists who are coming to the Maldives. And we see a number of Bollywood stars also going to the Maldives, and it is, uh, uh, it is acting as a good publicity for our tourism sector, so that is very important. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, India and uh, Maldives uh, share a unique uh, bond uh, based on mutual respect, uh, trust, uh, and understanding that goes uh, beyond uh, simple geographical and uh, historical and cultural ties. Uh, as uh, the Honorable Minister, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar, mentioned, uh, there is a fundamental difference between the uh, developmental projects that we are carrying with the Indian assistance. Uh, I believe that is that the, the, the developmental projects uh, that we are carrying with Indian assistance is mainly geared towards future growth, which is very important. Uh, what are the developmental projects that are carried out right now? Number one, uh, as mentioned by the minister, we are having a uh, Greater Mali connectivity project, which will actually transform uh, Maldivian economy, and it is also uh, uh, we we are also uh, relocating our commercial port, which is in Mali, to a nearby island, which will connect this uh, connectivity bridge, which will mean actually um, that will drive that will drive our economic growth in the few, in the years to come. And then we are also developing two international airports in the north, uh, one in the north, one in the south. In the north, uh, which is the Hanimado International Airport, uh, which, which will have a capacity of around 1.8 to 2.1 million tourists a year. And when we do that, it will also mean that more investors go to the uh, north, where actually we have much more beautiful islands then, which is actually in the center where we have most of the resorts now. And also in the south, uh, South Gain International Airport, again um, being developed with the uh, assistance of uh, line of credit facility from Exim, will have a capacity of around 1.8 million. So now we, we are a, a $6 billion economy but when we do these uh, international airports in the north and in the south, in a few years' time, let's say in five, ten years, we are looking at not a six billion dollar economy, I believe, we are looking at, let's say, 15, uh, 20 billion dollar economy. And also we have uh, very important basic infrastructures, uh, water and sanitation projects, uh, when we came into this government in 2000, end of 2018, we had only around 30 percent of our country had proper water and sanitation projects. Uh, but now with the assistance of uh, Indian Exim, uh, we are currently having water and sanitation projects in all of the other 70 percent of the islands. So by the end of this year, we, we will, in all of the islands, we will have proper water and sanitation 
completed. So I believe uh, these are very important projects, meaning that more economic activity can actually take place in these islands once these projects are completed. And the other thing is the, I am very uh, happy that most of these projects are carried out in a transparent uh, manner. Uh, the pre-qualification processes happen in, in, in India, and then also there is a proper tendering process in, the, in, in, in Mali as well. So, uh, so we have uh, most of these developmental projects uh, carried out with the assistance of um, Indian Exim. And also there are buyer's credit uh, projects, social housing projects at the moment. We are carrying out around 6,000 so social housing uh, projects are being carried out with the assistance of uh, uh, buyer's credit uh, funding. Uh, so I believe that most of these projects will, once completed, will transform Maldives' economy from a six, seven billion dollar economy to a 15, 20 billion dollar economy. These projects are purely uh, designed always growth in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, We're going to turn to the audience, but uh, as we do that, and I do hope the microphones are ready, uh, I cannot but ask Dr. Jayashankar, um, you know, foreign policy has now gone down to the masses, largely because of social media, but also because uh, communication has become so much easier. And uh, you uh, have become a, a kind of star in the eyes of uh, the general public, uh, not just here in Pune, but all over the world. So my question to you, sir, and uh, is, is this, can we call this the Jaishankar doctrine of Indian foreign policy? Not really. I think there's somebody who had already laid claim, and he happens to be my boss. Uh, and rightly so, because you know, if there was a s one, uh, every, every doctrine policy shift requires one uh, inflection point that you need to capture uh, in public mind. To me, it was the swearing in ceremony uh, in 2014. The fact that all, are, you know, the fact that it even occurred to an incoming Prime Minister of India saying, look, there's a change of God, a big change, a very fundamental change happening in India, but let me now share it with my neighborhood. That, to me, actually showed neighborhood first. The, you know, we, at, at that time, of course, I was not even in the ministry, I was in Washington. But to me, that was the inflection point, and then it's developed uh, bit, bit by bit. So you're saying we can call it the Modi doctrine of Indian foreign policy. Let's, let's go turn to the audience, and I see a number of hands up. I think uh, what I'd request you to is identify yourself, um, tell us whom the question is aimed at or, or who directed at, and uh, try to be as brief as possible. I th thought I saw Mr. Sudhir Mehta put his hand up. Could we have the mic here, please? And we will come to the others. We'll do a round of three questions, and then uh, you know, take answers to them, and then see if we have time for more. So thank you, Gautam. And uh, first of all, uh, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, I think as a Punekar, you all of you spoke about the importance of an airport, which was fantastic to hear. But uh, I'll ask the, my question. I, I, I got that message. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, I'll ask my question on what's a very important area, which is currency. I think uh, one of the things that, uh, at least as citizens, we noticed earlier this week, and I think this was a extremely important event uh, was uh, the India-Singapore deal for the UPI where now any Indian citizen or any Singapore citizen can send around 60,000 rupees a day between the two countries. Given that 20% of uh, the world trade will come from India in the coming uh, decades, does this really go towards a systematic shift towards uh, our uh, foreign exchange and currency policy? Because to a great extent, while we are beginning to be a more important part of world trade, we are really dependent on the dollar. Are we, is this a first step where we are going to see that uh, 
we can have uh, all of these kinds of connections. And if that's the case, then I would say that's a very big positive because with the diaspora all around the world, and then hopefully this transcends into something which is more economic. Would like to get your views on this, Dr. Jayshankar. Let, let's take a next question and I see a hand up here. Ambassador Karamuru from Brazil, uh, do you have a question, sir? Uh, here, please, in front, right in front. Aage hai yahan pe. Can we have another microphone? Uh, maybe, maybe I should talk no. close to the microphone. Marcos Caramuru from Brazil, Sebring. I see that the, one, the subtitle of this conference is Asia in the Emerging World Order. And one of the main features of the new order, of the emerging order, is the emergence of Asia as a leader. First, uh, with a contribution to world growth, very significant, I would say, and this year is going to be very important. But with time, with its contribution to values, with ideas, with a new approaches to the world reality. Then I would like to listen from Mr. Minister Jashankar and the other ministers as well. What's their vision of this new role of Asia as a leader in world reality? Thank you. Thank you for that question. One more hand at the same table. Uh, yes, please. Yes, sir. Amit Paranspe, Pune International Center. I have a quick short question. You talked about our uh, Western neighbor. Uh, can you talk a little about our Northern neighbor and how our economic relationship uh, may evolve uh, in the coming years? So that's a round of three questions. And uh, maybe we can start with uh, Dr. Jayashankar, if you can, because all three questions were aimed at you, but one no, was for I, the other I minister. I think the first question actually is in a way better answered by, I mean, remember, we have two finance ministers Yes, here. absolutely. I'm just a humble foreign minister. <laughs> uh, so these guys are the serious guys in the business. Yes. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, my, uh, to me, as, as a very interested, you know, a member of the government who obviously watches uh, financial and digital financial issues move forward, what happened with Singapore was something very, very significant but it's it's one step this is a long arduous road you know uh, uh, I know people uh, it's it's in our nature to define uh, in this respect very ambitious uh, objectives that you know one day the dollars there and you know when will the rupee uh, internationalize to our point but look at countries who are much bigger than us you know who economically who have actually been uh, challenged, uh, they made a lot of progress. I mean, in a way, it, re it relates to the last question. Uh, uh, they made a lot of progress, but it's much easier said than done. And uh, to me, I mean, I have two finance ministers here, but what has the last year shown us? The last year has shown us that whenever the world is in trouble, the world heads towards the dollar. I mean, that's also a reality that, but maybe the first question, uh, you gentlemen need to come in and then I could, uh, you know, look at yeah. the other two. So, so let me turn to the Honorable Finance Minister of the Maldives, Mr. Ibrahim Amir. If you could go first on that question about, uh, you know, about the development. How do you see the idea of a UPI arrangement with Singapore? How would it apply to you? And also Ambassador Karamuru's question about what what is Asia bringing to the table as, uh, you know, world economic growth? Uh, continues higher and upward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so you know, uh, Maldives is uh, uh, very much reliant on our imports. Uh, we actually import um, maybe more than 99% uh, of all our uh, goods are imported from abroad. And a large percentage of that imports also do come from uh, India as well. Uh, we have been in talks with uh, Reserve Bank of India as well um, uh, with regard to ru rupee card, uh, rufia, uh, rupees settlement, uh, so that uh, 
uh, it is all the import it all the more important because uh, right now we also face the issue of uh, depleting uh, US dollar reserves as well because of the increase in oil prices uh, so that discussion is uh, uh, progressing with Reserve Bank of India and our central bank as well. We are also very much involved in that. And currently uh, also the, the National Bank Bank of Maldives uh, also are involved in this. Uh, and not only uh, the ru rupee settlement, uh, but also we are in talks with other uh, countries where we import heavily with regard to how we can actually have uh, our local currency and their currency settlement. Uh, so that is already in progress. Hopefully we can uh, achieve that as soon as possible. And the other thing is with regard to how um, Asia can help in this uh, emerging uh, world order. And I believe even now uh, uh, we, we are doing that because um, the, if you look at the uh, recent uh, IMF reports as well, it says that the world uh, economic growth is actually led by countries uh, in, uh, like India, like China, and other countries in Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, and other countries. Uh, so I believe uh, we are already doing that. And while we are doing that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it is very important um, uh, that we also uh, address the issues of climate financing so that the our countries like Maldives can actually uh, benefit from that. Thank you. Linpo, could I turn to you to answer those same questions, please? Thank you. Uh, I think more than, more than an uh, answer, I think probably mine would be uh, kind of uh, the suggestion, uh, I would say my own, uh, the, the submissions on this uh, two uh, pertinent questions raised by two gen gentlemen. On the UPI, uh, the, 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 that government of India has initiated with Singapore, I see this as a very, very welcoming kind of uh, an, an in initiative and I only pray that this, if this could be rolled out further, you know, like because I see that this is, I don't, this is a, a, a way forward for in, in the 21st century, basically to, to uh, uh, ease uh, the, uh, the, the, the way of uh, doing business and as well, because uh, uh, see the case in Bhutan, because uh, we, we have a lot of difficulties for our Bhutanese diaspora, uh, those who are living abroad in terms of uh, sending back the money and it has a lot of restrictions. Uh, every country has their own financial re restriction regulations. So for that matter, especially in, in, in the United States as well in Australia, people are facing a lot of difficulties to send back the money. Uh, so for that matter, I see uh, that uh, the, 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 the f financial technologies like this kind of uh, the, the UPI and all these things is only going to, uh, you know, not only in India, but especially the neighboring countries we see that there's an opportunity for us to leverage and write on that platform uh, uh, in, in near future. Uh, as such in Bhutan, uh, especially for the Indian tourists and uh, for ease of uh, uh, making a payment and transfer of money, we have uh, uh, already adopted and launched uh, together with the Honorable Finance Minister of India, we have already launched Rupee Card and uh, BIM uh, in, in, in Bhutan. So, I think these are all kind of a welcoming gesture, but uh, uh, the, pertinent, uh, the, 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 the specific question that uh, you have asked, I think uh, I'll still leave this up to the <laughs> uh, Honorable Minister here. On the second question, uh, Asia and the emerging world order, I see uh, my answer, response will be the same as uh, spelled out by the Maldivian Finance Minister, Honorable Finance Minister, because uh, is only the figure from the figure we can make out that uh, India contributes almost 9.2 percent to global GDP. So this in itself shows that uh, I think the trend is already uh, trend has already reversed, and uh, the whole order has already changed. And I could with with a lot of pride I can say that uh, it's only going to grow stronger. And uh, for me I see that 
the theme is very, very pertinent because it is, it is already, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's already imperative that, uh, you know, uh, India combined with China almost contributes around 50 percent to global GDP. This in itself shows, uh, forget about remaining uh, the Asian countries, but I think two countries massively contributes to global GDP. So I think it, the whole order has already changed probably. I think this, this, this need not be qualified. This need not even qualify to be a tagline basically. It has already reversed the order. Thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, 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 respond to the world order question. I mean, n there's, there's no doubt, I think all of us, uh, at the, you know, on the podium, I think on the floor as well, know that the role of Asia, the salience of Asia will increase. But I think there are two cautions we need to keep in mind. One, it's Asia is growing because Asia has been global. What we should not fall for is this kind of Asia for Asians. Uh, that kind of rhetoric is very misleading. It, is, it kind of appeals to a very primitive uh, chauvinism in people. It actually has a very deep strategic uh, intent behind it. Uh, and uh, Asia will grow, will have a greater role, provided Asia remains consciously global. The second point uh, there is also Asia itself must strive to be more multipolar. That when we speak about a multipolar world, which means you know, there are more countries, the diversity is better expressed, it should not be that Asia is less multipolar and the world is then expected to be more multipolar. World will be multipolar, world will be diverse and democratic only when Asia will be diverse and democratic. And that responsibility of making Asia multipolar particularly falls on India. The question on China. I do believe that the economic challenges presented by uh, our relationship with China are really very, very serious, uh, very formidable. Uh, I not entirely convinced that they've been addressed in that manner, not now, I mean over the last 20 years. I want to remind some of you that about, uh, in fact in 2006, we could actually even have contemplated an FTA with China. This was a goal which was agreed to between the governments of India and the governments of China when President Hu Jintao, am I correct? Uh, was visiting uh, India. At that time, it looked, uh, it looked something which was reasonable because it was an optimistic era of the relationship. It was a time when people felt that, you know, Chinese uh, presence would grow, our presence would grow, somewhere we would find maybe not a perfect balance but some kind of balance. It was predicated on the fact that there would be uh, reasonable market access to the Chinese economy. And in fact, I remember meeting Narayan, Mr. Narayan Murthy in Shanghai when he too came with that expectation in mind. The reality has turned out to be something very, very different. And in fact, what happened was not just unequal market access. There was very little northward market access. We actually saw migration of business not migration of company, migration of business, meaning the businesses which used to be done in India actually migrated to China, obviously under Chinese ownership. And the result of what we see today, the very, very severe imbalance, is an accumulation of all of that. Now, it's very, you know, this, by the way, is, becomes a very, uh, sometimes, a, I mean, I'm trying to find a polite adjective here, uh, uh, let us say a dumbed down political debate. It isn't. It's a, it's a very serious matter. And the responsibility here is not just of the government. It's an equal responsibility of businesses. If we have today a huge imbalance of uh, trade with China. Now, again, on anybody doing trade will not have a problem with an imbalance per se. It is nobody's contention uh, unless you are Donald Trump that you know every trade account must be uh, accurately balanced. Economics doesn't work that way. But 
when there is this kind of imbalance, where comparative advantages do not matter at all, where there are a lot of non-market factors at play, that production is determined by non-market factors, but you're giving entry on the basis, you're giving market access, assuming that mar you know, this is some kind of market competition. So there's something fundamentally flawed here. And as I said, a lot of it depends on Indian corporates, that Indian corporates haven't developed the kind of uh, uh, backwards uh, vendor uh, supplies and uh, uh, you know components and parts and ingredients and intermediates that should be supporting us. Uh, so, and again, you could argue maybe the government didn't do enough. I think that's a reasonable point. So, we are today trying to change this. You know, when you look, you know, when you say Atma Nirbhar Bharat, it's not a slogan. It's actually a messaging to industry, to people saying, please, what you can source from India, you have an obligation to source, not as a moral obligation. Our national security is a threat if we have this kind of massive external exposure. And we saw that very graphically during COVID. So, uh, today when we do PLI, production linked incentives. The purpose of it is to bring back, we have to create a manufacturing culture in this country. You know, those who say, you know, we should focus on services. Yes, services have a role. We may be good at it. But a major economy cannot be service, uh, that service centric and neglect manufacture. And those who, I mean, I'm, I've been very blunt about it. I mean, those who do down manufacturing, uh, they are actually damaging this country's strategic future. That uh, we cannot build the deep strengths, we cannot build the national security basic requirements unless we have, uh, you know, a, a significant industrial capacity. I know I'm saying this at Pune, which is very much at the heart of this, uh, this culture, but I do think if there is a, a big China debate to be had in this country. It needs to be actually focused on what is it we should do to rectify what is clearly a very unsatisfactory state of affairs. Thank you very much, all three ministers. We have run out of time, in fact, exceeded our time. So let me bring this inaugural session to an end. Please joining me, join me in applauding the three ministers. Thank you very much for your presence here in Pune. Uh, also, as a token of our appreciation, we'll be gifting you a book by the Pune International Center on how India should approach the China challenge, how India should approach the China question. I hope the government does take some of these uh, suggestions on board. But thank you very much, all three ministers. Thank you for being with us. Um, I'll, I'll just request them to, uh, to bring in the gifts. Hello. Finally, we have to have a group photo here of all the speakers. May I invite the president of the PIC, Dr. Mar